transition to coordination today. Uh, Jessica, lead us off.
which is that first part right here, the two. Multiply it by our reference voltage and you'll get 236 volts across a 240 volt winding. Then we'll bring it down in here and start calculating for the complex power, whereas your voltage reference of the, that's absorbed by the load was that 12 kVA, and we're multiplying it here by that power factor, and this is a polar representation of the power factor to get it into the current, and we'll get this, which is your complex power, and relating it back to that power triangle on the, on the um, X axis. And next we'll calculate using this, we'll bring it back down to where you get in terms of your load current and then your voltage, which is the 118 from your reference, divided by the current will get you your load impedance, which is represented right here. And to break it down using your complex power, the real part is that real power, and the imaginary part is your reactive power, which is your K bar. I have a picture that will, that goes <laughs> better faster. I'm sure everyone's seen this too, so let's put it in turn. Here's your real power, your imaginary power, and your KBA right there. So this would be your, like the size of the transformer, how much real power is used of that transformer, and then there's your K bar, where it's wasted electricity usable. And on the side right here, to get into the <coughs> words that they use. Uh, real power over your KVA or your parent power would be a, a simpler way to calculate your power factor than going through all that imaginary stuff and things like that that isn't helpful in the field, but I thought it's helpful just to, so you know that it's there. So an example right here, the 150 KW divided by uh, say a 225 kVA transformer, your power factor is 0.66, and we'll denote that as 0.66 lagging, and when we take the cosine inverse of that power factor, that 48 degrees, we use that in the side of, uh, re in the, more in the relay side of it, and that's how we'll calculate the phase angle between your voltage and your current. And so that angle is important to us, when we start programming relays. Next example I'll go over is just uh, going over how to calculate your voltage drop. So here's a basic voltage drop calculation where you know your length of run, the size of the wire, your secondary voltage, and a known horsepower. So an example uh, in your everyday use would be a member wants to convert their wells to electric and the total horsepower that they have is 75 on a 240-480 volt system with a run of 1100 feet of 4 out wire. And now, uh, if you, I put this calculation right here, uh, I know we have the calculators that do it, but if you want to see it, you would take your 75 horsepower and multiply it by the 746 watts, and I have a slide further on that, um, why we use that number. And you'll divide it by the voltage, which is 480, the efficiency of a motor, and we represent that as just 90%, because motors these days are very efficient. And, we'll, and when we model it in our windmill software, we use a power factor of 75 for anything irrigation and the 1.73 comes into play later on as well. I'll touch more on that. That is just the square root of three for a three-phase system. So when you do, all, do that equation right there, you'll get your 99.8 amps with the no horsepower. And then you'll, step two is where you start going into your voltage drop. Two times your current, times your impedance of the wire, times the length of the run, times that square root of three, the 1.73. And the any time, so for example, the four out wire, that is a known impedance and you can look that up and that's where that number 0. 0.00051 ohms comes from. And once you plug it into that equation right there, 
you'll get a voltage drop of 19.37 volts off of the 480. And to get into the percentage, just divide that 19.37, divide by the 480, and then multiply by 100 to get into your percentage, where you get the 4.03%. And I highlighted that because at spec, we don't do anything if it's uh, above 3% voltage drop. And I believe, I've, Alan might know more about that if it's a, uh, for NESC, it's 6%, but we do 3% here. I'm sorry, that's all for uh, yeah, it's five. it's five. Yeah, official code's 5%, but we try to stay under 3%. So in this example where you get 4.3%, it wouldn't work for us. We would find um, another way to do it, either go overhead some more, or uh, try to run it a different way, upgrade the wire size or something like that. Bigger wire. Yeah, bigger wire. An example on uh, sizing your transformers, if you have a single phase secondary voltage of 122.40 and a member says, hey, I want a 200 amp service, you would just multiply that 120 times your 200 amp service and divide by 1,000 to get your KVA rating for your transformer, which would come out to 24 KVA. They, we don't have any of those, but we do have a 25 KVA transformer. So that's why a 200 amp service, why we hang a 25 kVA pot. <coughs> Any questions on that one? Now, here's a, an example if you were sizing a transformer, and I gave an irrigation example where it's a three phase secondary voltage of 240, 480, and Say uh, the member has two 40 horsepower wells and two seven and a half horsepower pivots. You add up that, you, your total horsepower of 95. And that's where we were using in the previous example of this 746 watts. Because one, one horsepower equals 0.746 kW. And when we're in the field, we just round that off to one kW for quicker calculations. So. If you're doing this you know, on a calculator, you would multiply the 95 horsepower times your 0.746, and you get 70.87 kW. So we would want 75 kVA transformer for a bank of 35s. And if you were in the field, you would multiply that 95 times 1, and you'd get 95. And you're like, well, that's we would need to go to 100. Um, the transformers, when you do irrigation, because they're not always running, uh, uh, like kind of a cheap method, because the transformer can run hot and it can handle more than what it's rated for. And it, the more you use of your transformer, the more it's efficient. So uh, 75 kVA, which is a bank of 25s, they can handle 25 more of that. And, that, that, and that's where we're more comfortable. Now, if it was say 120 kW, then we would have to go up a size of transformers. And the last thing I'm going to touch on is uh, fault currents in the transformer. So transformers obviously are very powerful and they have, um, they can have extremely high fault currents uh, when a fault does occur. And so, just to kind of hit it home, really, um, using the simple Ohm's Law rule, whereas uh, the voltage will stay the same, but if a fault occurs, that the Z, the impedance, will go low, causing your current to still go high. For example, the example I gave is if a line's on the ground one mile outside of a substation, it'll have a very low impedance where it's near, it's near zero, where that wire on the ground is the only thing that it has really is the impedance of the wire and the transformer that's nearby. So that, that current that's still there is extremely high because you have a very low impedance. Is there any questions on that one? And that was my last, my last, uh,
stuff. So if you want to come over, switch switch spots with me.
Oh, okay, excuse me. And then when you're out in the field too, uh, this is a good way to double check us that we're not just making up crap. Um, that uh, when you're sizing two T fuses, you can usually just go two sizes up for the upline fuse, and that should be about where you want to be. Now that falls apart a little bit on the really big stuff, but you know your uh, 10s, 20s, everything just go up two sizes in T fuse, and that's what you should need for coordination. That's a good, a good rule of thumb, and it does hold um, when you create the graphs. Uh, these are, uh, this is what I would say, this would be bad fuse coordination. This is only if you step one size up. Um, as you can see, there's, a, there's no space in between here. Now, they do, you know, the blue one is still slower than the black one, so there is, they're not 100% on top of each other, but what this is telling us that there may be times when those fuses would blow at the same time, or even the blue may blow before the black one, the upline fuse will blow before the downline fuse. And so we just don't want that. We want to add in that gap to give ourselves a little bit of breathing room. All right, then we're going to add in the recoilers. Recoilers, uh, the model here, uh, dip, uh, with just two lines, there's the fast curve and the slow curve. Uh, recoilers um, come with all different styles of curves, and you can request them. This is kind of when you pick what type of curves to use, we line them up on this graph and see what looks the best. Um, the, uh, what you're seeing here is the fast curve and the slow curve. So when a recoiler reacts, when it first sees that fault, it'll, again, will draw a line vertical. If it sees 800 amp fault, it'll go up and it'll hit this first curve and it'll clear. It'll, it'll pop out and then it'll close back in and it'll, it starts that timing all over again. We start over at the bottom and we say, all right, the fault's still there. We ride that 800 amp fault again. Boom, we hit that fast curve, it clears again. On that third reposing, well, on a, let's say this is a three, a third operation. Um, then it'll, this, uh, this fast curve drops out. It doesn't care about that one anymore. It only waits on the slow curve. And that fault is still there. All right, through. Well, then we intersect the fuse first. We clear the fuse completely before we even start filling with the uh, slow curve of the recloser. And so that's why these char charts are kind of depicting here. You do have to know how many operations it is. I know there's all different shapes and sizes of those. Um, you have two fast, one slow, two fast, two slow, um, two sideways, one upside down. Whichever one you pick, uh, there's all different kinds, but I just have to know when you're sizing these up, um, that's what we're looking at. So again, we always want, uh, just looking for space, and we always want the fuse to blow before the slow curve of the recloser. Uh, what we have here, uh, what you may have heard as well, is we have a fuse save scheme, which is what we do want in, the, in an optimal situation to keep you know, fuses are great, but to try and keep every little fault from blowing a fuse, we try to have the recloser take care of the temporary faults before a fuse will uh, bail out. And so this is purposeful. We do we do like the fast curve to take out most faults before the fuse blows if it's a uh, if if it's not a permanent fault. So um, fuse save, save scheme is good, and we keep it as much as we can. Uh, so this is straight in contrast. Again, this would be a bad <coughs> coordination. Um, so if we draw that same line, that same 800 amp fault, and we go all the way up, we hit the fast curve, we do a couple operations, we hit the slow curve, and then we hit the fuse. Now at really high amp faults, yes, it does work fine, but not at our, uh, our lower amperage faults, which is probably what we're gonna see down line anyway, which is those little bit lower amperage faults. And, uh, and so we would uh, throw that guy out. <coughs> Alright, and then, uh, so now we've done recloser, diffuse, and then if we step back again to the feeder. Uh, feeder is are a little different than the reclosers. Reclosers come with program curves and program characteristics, you know. Um, the 6H's and can operate individually, the R's operate all, through, all at the same time. Whereas with feeders, since they're programmed through relays, you can have them do um, all that kind in one unit. Uh, you can have it act however you want, and you can choose when it, uh, when at what uh, amperages it'll pick up those faults, and uh, when it'll clear those faults. Uh, so what it does is you take those CT ratios. You know you have CTs that are attached um, either on the line breakers or the ones in the sub. I'll take those CT ratios. So this is a 600 to 5 CT ratio. 600 divided by 5, 120. Uh, it does. We add a multiplier to it, and then we uh, and that is how we have to add that multiplier, really does the math, and then just tells us that the ground pickup 
is 300 amps here uh, within a phase 600. Uh, th a 600 phase and a 300 ground is pretty standard on all of our 477. Um, all the major subs have this same uh, predicament here, or excuse me, setup. Uh, it is nice though on these feeders because we can organize these curves through wherever we want. We can shove them right, on, move them around the graph, left, up, down. You don't have to buy certain breakers at the substation like you do reclosers. These you can program in and shift however you need them. Uh, they also, we also added this cross section here. Um, because at these very high amperage faults, timing does become very important. Um, even even a couple of cycles can mean the difference between damaging equipment and cleaning the fault at a good amount of time. So we will, we add in uh, about 0.1 seconds here, which actually is slow for the uh, breaker to actually open. So what this is showing here is that at a very high amperage fault, we want to count for the time that it takes for that fault to be sensed and then that breaker to actually open. And so uh, that's what we're uh, what we're seeing there. And then these only oh yeah another other thing here. In the loader system, we only operate on slow curves. So well, there are no fast curves here that pick up faults. The idea being we didn't want to blink an entire circuit um, for a vertical line if we didn't have to. Uh, now that is different in the Brazos system. They do uh, program fast curves. Uh, it has to do just with uh, preference and length of line, I believe. Neither way is really wrong. It's just mostly preference. Uh, so here's what we would see um, if we had that same recloser with the feeder. Um, at this one, we're not looking for only space, we're looking for timing. Uh, because mostly because these get so fast that even there's a lot of space over here, um, since it's so far such a high amperage fault, these, and the times are so low here, we want to make sure we have at least um, two tenths of a second between when that slow curve of the recloser bails out and when that feeder will pick it up. Uh, Let's see, we, uh, yeah, when, we, when we're sizing this, we'll use the fault current at the recloser. Uh, fault current is, we can calculate fault current on any point in line, or at least approximate it at any point in line because of the map being correct and having correct impedance values on the entire system. Uh, so all that's just, having correct map is really important for, for fault current analysis and for coordination analysis. Because right here, what we're saying is that the max fault at this downline recloser is about 1,200 uh, 12 amps. And at that max fault, we want to make sure that this recloser is bailing out before the feeder. And that's what we're showing here. Um, now, again, uh, say I'm kind of using our bigger stuff as an example. So this would be like what we said, upland a lot of all those huge fuses. Uh, here's an 18. Uh, with an upland feeder. Um, here, you know, just looking for space. Not No timings here. Uh, just want to see, make sure that fuse has time to clear way before we intersect um, the feeder curves. All right, so anyway, so here's what the total circuit would look like. Uh, again, you have your X fuse, recloser, T fuse, uh, recloser slow, and then feeder. Um, and all this can be shifted around and gets a little, it can get really dense if you wanted to. Uh, we usually take it one step at a time and slowly step our way back. Um, yeah, and as we go, we try, yeah, we try to just, uh, keep everything lined up correctly, and it's always, always kind of good to make a last reference at the end. But that's all I've got here. And I do have, I was going to say if you have any questions, we can just look at them right now. But they're doing self updates. So anyway, if y'all have any questions on this, or y'all ever see weird sizing in the field, uh, maybe we're calling for work life change that doesn't make sense. Although I never get calls on that. But uh, the uh, we you just uh, stop by by all means. We can pull this up. We can hash it out and figure it out. This isn't the whole whole story. Um, I just want y'all get y'all into these curves and how they line up. There's other factors that come into play, such as you know make sure we're not overfusing for small wire. Putting too high a feeder settings for small wire, that's really easy to do. Um, what kind of reposers are the best? There's a lot of discussions to be had there, kind of aside from just how the curves line up. But uh, yeah, if you all want to open that up, if you ever see anything odd or things like that that we may need to look at and fix, the bottom means you're on it every day, so we can check it out. Nothing we do is that really a secret. So, any questions? Comments? Time to go.